Hello and welcome. My name is Father William Maestri, and this is another edition of Overfed and Undernourished. In our last uh, particular uh, edition of Overfed and Undernourished, I asked you if uh, you could stand a little good news. Well, let me switch gears for this particular uh, episode and say that uh, a comment about the uh, election, uh, national election, uh, for 2020. Um, there's a lot to be troubled about. There's a lot to be questioned about. And I'm sure it will all be sorted out in due course. Um, but the thing that is very disturbing, that has just kind of surfaced, is the development of a blacklist. That's what it's being called. That is, of people who worked for, supported, and even legally defended in various judicial and congressional proceedings uh, the President of the United States, individual attorneys, along with the law firms that they happen to work for. And this is not just a kind of whisper uh, thing, oh, did you hear what we're doing, or it's secret or it's uh, somehow clandestine. It's out in the public. Uh, it's put on, this, uh, on the computers of what they're asking for. For example, former Labor Secretary Robert Reich. Uh, <clears throat> he is uh, proposing the uh, appointment of a truth and so-called reconciliation committee to uh, somehow get together all of those who uh, worked for Trump and all of those who anyway supported him, especially within government, that they would be called before this particular committee and shown the error of their ways and I guess make contrition and reparation and uh, all of those uh, kinds of things. Others would be punished financially by reputation. They would not uh, be considered for jobs and that would kind of follow them, a kind of scarlet letter or a Salem witch trial. Now, this is in the United States of America. Now, I don't care if you're red state, blue, straight, blue state, or some color in between. This is not America. And this is not what we do. This is not the kind of people we are. At least, it's not the kind of people we used to be. And we hear all of this talk about reconciliation, about coming together. And when you have the former first lady uh, putting out on her uh, tweets or whatever the thing is, uh, she says that uh, those who voted for uh, President Trump uh, show a willingness to vote for racist policies and uh, various other litanies of uh, flaws in their character. And we have to bring them together uh, in order, we have to talk to them and get them together with the idea, I imagine, of raising their consciousness and their conscience to see the error of their ways. Now, it's very hard to start with reconciliation if you start off with the idea that these people are racist, along with being xenophobic uh, against uh, uh, the uh, homosexual groups and so on, especially given the fact that President Trump gained more votes than any other Republican for those who identified themselves as uh, within the homosexual grouping. And it's very difficult to proceed with any kind of real discussion when you already start with the idea of this. Not simply that I disagree with you. Not simply that I think you have a wrong policy. Not simply that I think you have made a wrong judgment based upon what's best for the country, a policy, uh, some kind of executive decision, etc. But it's that you're evil, that you're a bad, morally corrupt, person. Now once I start with that premise, 
And then I come to the conclusion, well, we all have to work together. It's very difficult. Try it one on one. Go up to someone and say to them, I really want to reconcile with you because we know that you are a racist, a xenophobe. You have a tremendous animosity towards homosexuals. You don't want uh, the Latinos into the country. And uh, you are basically a nationalist kind of person that it's the United States against the world. Now let's sit down and talk once you agree to that. Uh, that, that doesn't seem to most normal people to be conducive to any kind of dialogue, conversation, or certainly reconciliation. But the idea that we're now going to develop committees to weed out those who somehow, in their misguided way, for some in their evil ways, we're going to weed them out and put them into a kind of, uh, well, we, we couldn't do this, I suppose, I don't know, some kind of re-education program, re-education camps that goes on in other countries, but not in the United States. I remember back in the uh, 1950s when we had the McCarthy hear hearings uh, that caused such tremendous turmoil in the country, especially as it related to Hollywood, by the way, in which so many actors, screenwriters, <clears throat> those who worked uh, behind the scenes, producers, directors, they were put on a list. And many of them were uh, blackballed. Uh, they would deny jobs, opportunities to work, even the mere rumor or the association was enough to, say, to take some of the greatest talent that was present in Hollywood up to that particular time and smear them with the idea of communist sympathizer. Um, <clears throat> President uh, Nixon had his enemies list and the nation was repulsed by that particular idea that those in powerful places have lists of enemies and those who will be punished because they happen not to agree. They happen not to conform to what seems to be, as uh, George Orwell called it, those uh, puny and despicable little orthodoxies that we call today being politically correct. And if you don't agree, you will be punished. If you're a business, you will be boycotted. What happened to the free exchange of ideas, of civility in conversation? And at the end of the day, we may have to agree to disagree without being disagreeable. And we have to remember <clears throat> that what goes around comes around. And maybe in the future, another group will get into control and power, and they will have their own list. And I remember what turned the McCarthy hearings. Uh, the counsel uh, for the defense, a man by the name of Walsh, he looked at Senator McCarthy. He looked at Senator McCarthy, and these hearings were televised, and they were recorded on film and all over the news. He looked at Senator McCarthy after one particular round of questioning that was really accusations. And he said this. He said, Senator, have you no shame? Have you no shame? And that turned the entire hearing around. And it turned the American people around. Because in those simple words, he struck a chord of basic decency within human beings, and certainly within the American creed. Have you no shame? Please understand, he did not say, do you have guilt? Guilt is psychological and individual. Shame has to do with a larger context. It has, it, it's a social uh, embarrassment. It, it's a social uh, uh, movement of the person 
to look beyond themselves to something deeper, family, community, church, uh, that kind of corporate or community understanding that we simply do not live for ourselves and by ourselves and our behavior does not simply affect us only. It ripples out to affect others. Have you no shame? Well, when we start talking about blacklist, punishing groups that don't agree with my orthodoxy, that don't agree with my stance on a policy or an issue, I'm not wrong. I'm evil. I have a bad character. I'm a bad person. And that is very, very dangerous. It's a very, very troubling road to go down. Uh, once we start mixing that uh, as to who's in and who's out, who's acceptable and who is unclean, the unwashed, and can never be washed as long as you hold those particular positions. But over time, the unwashed have a way of becoming those who sit in the bathhouses and are washed. And those who were once lecturing about the need to be clean, come clean, are the ones who find themselves uh, in the dirt. This is a very, very dangerous thing. We expect this from other countries. Uh, we say, well, that's just the way they do business. We're the United States. We don't act that way. <clears throat> well, if you read some of the communiques of elected officials, government of federal officials, state officials, and the rhetoric that is going out at this particular time, all the while talking about, talking about reconciliation and healing and coming together. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is one time in which your words are too loud for my action, because it's hard to believe that we can somehow square that circle. How do we get the morally bankrupt and corrupt and then sit down and talk? But there's only one condition. Admit that indeed you are bankrupt. You are morally corrupt. That's not a bridge. That's a barricade. That's a barricade. And we have enough of those. So I think that this is a very troubling thing. In addition, uh, the news media, large corporations, big tech, uh, the banks, Wall Street, uh, they have poured enormous amounts of money into this particular uh, cycle of elections. Now, all of those who decried big money in politics were buying elections. We have to get the big money out, the big influence. The silence is deafening. The silence is deafening. And uh, that, is, that is something that corrupts democracy. That is something that corrupts a republic. It's still we the people. We the people. And the supreme law of the land is the Constitution of the United States. It's not what some corporation says. It's not what some media outlet says. That's, that's f nowhere mentioned, and it's not even uh, uh, considered. And yet, enormous amounts of power concentrated. And if you look at the documents of the founders, you look at their writings, and you look at what they wrote and their pamphlets, one of the great fears that they, have, that they had, if not the biggest fear, was the concentration of power in the hands of the few at the expense of the many. That is something that has been a tremendous fear, the, the, the development of a Leviathan, to use Thomas Hobbes' uh, imagery, where government, big interest, big money, big corporations have their tentacles in every particular aspect of the individual's life and in the life of a society. That's called totalitarianism. It's an oligarchy. It's the very antithesis of the participatory democracy and of a republic. It's still we, the people. That's how the Constitution begins.
we the people. And people, they sacrificed lives, fortunes, and sacred honor so that we could live free. I simply end with this. After the Constitutional Convention, the so-called miracle at Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin was coming out of the hall and this lady came up to him and said, well, Dr. Franklin, what have you all done in there? What have you given us? And Benjamin Franklin said, Madam, we've given you a republic if you can keep it. That's a tremendous conditional because America is an experiment and each generation is tested. Can we keep it? This is our hour of testing. Will we keep it?